section of the discussion, though we apologize in advance if we don't have time to answer all of them. Um, let's introduce this great event. A leader in digital communication and grassroots political campaigns explains how the internet and modern media have undermined America and how we can reclaim our voices for the good of civic life. Michael Slaby helped lead Obama for America as Chief Integration and Innovation Officer in 2012, where he oversaw all of technology and analytics, and as Deputy Digital Director and Chief Technology Officer in 2008. As a world leader in digital strategy and technology, Slaby has devoted his career to repairing our broken information systems. He currently serves as Community Director at the media research nonprofit Harmony Labs. Slaby is a graduate of Brown University. And he is in conversation this evening with actress and activist, Sophia Bush. On behalf of Politics and Prose in Washington, DC, please join me in welcoming Michael Slaby and Sophia Bush. Thank you both. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Julia. That was awesome. Uh, it's awesome, I was saying as we were getting ready, this is my home bookstore and man, do I miss bookstores. So this is a wonderful one to sort of be back in together. And uh, Sophia, thank you so much for being here to, to do this conversation together and sort of explore where we are and how we got here and where we go um, mm -hmm. in this conversation. So thanks for making time for this. Well, thank you for having me. I wouldn't have missed it. Um, I was thinking about this earlier today. You know, you and I were on the phone as we often are, but rather than talking about what we needed to fix in the world, we were talking about what we were gonna discuss on Zoom tonight. And one of the things that has impressed me about you since we became friends and for everyone here uh, who doesn't know Michael, I know some of you do, cause I can tell by the we love you slaby comments in the chat. Um, Michael and I met on the very first Obama campaign. Um, we had no idea, obviously, what was in store for us. But one of the things that always really amazed me about you, aside from the fact that you said that once I met your wife, she would be my favorite friend and I probably would stop returning your phone calls because I'd be on the phone with her all the time, which was only half true. I speak to you both very frequently. Um, you was it's the good to marry up. Like, I don't, I'm okay with I, that. Yeah, I mean, she's amazing. But you, you were a person who was moving mountains for democracy for the future potential of what the presidency could mean to so many more people, of, of what real representation could mean to so many more people, mobilizing so many young voters in a way we had never seen before, uh, a tradition which I'm happy to say we've all worked at carrying on for, for many elections since. But you were never one of the guys, and there were a lot of young kind of hotshot Politico dudes on that campaign, you were never one of the guys trying to take any of the credit. Um, I, I always joked that you were like this political Trojan horse and that I use um, my acting career to Trojan horse lots of political discourse. I'm out there, but uh, you know, people think they're coming to my Instagram for a selfie and we're talking about ratios of representation across America and who's getting funding and who isn't, um, whatever it takes, right? So I- It's the lesson I wish everybody would learn about celebrity, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Well, look, I don't expect everybody to love, you know, nerd statistics the way I do, but but I am very emboldened and bolstered by the fact that it seems that so many more people with platforms realize that they are privileges that we must be spending in defense of other people um, and in support really of, of our country and countries around the world. But you finally took so much of our advice and, uh, and demands for you sort of taking up more space. And you wrote the book we've all been asking for. This is why we're all here today. I'm going to hold this a lot today and I hope it does not bother you, but you're smiling, so I think we're okay. Um, but really I say all of this simply to ask you to kick off this lovely evening where we talk about what a new discourse is and where we talk about the transformation of stories because news media covers stories and as storytellers, both in uh, the theatrical world and the political world, we know a thing or two about those. I would love for you to tell the people who don't know you uh, as well as I and some of the folks in the chat do a little bit about yourself, about how you came to this point, what your career has looked like, um, you know, give us, give us the rundown. So I'll give you the, 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 the quick version of the not very straight path. 
um, because it, it has a lot to do with why I wrote the book. Um, and I, I appreciate, you know, sort of the invitation, you know, the invitation to take up a little space. It's, it is new to me, um, to be out from behind the curtain, uh, my whole career, mo pretty much all my career, I've been an operative. Um, I came to Paul, I grew up in Washington, DC politics and prose was my home bookstore. And like everybody who grows up in DC, it's a little bit politics and public service is a little bit in the air. It's in the water. It's just sort of part of everything. And, uh, I, and, and for me, that was true. I was always a passionate follower of politics, but I didn't work in politics until after the 04 election. And the 04 election, I, um, I lost my mind a little bit. I, I, I looked at what had happened at losing to President Bush a second time and was sort of bumfuzzled by what had just happened. I didn't understand how the Democrats had managed to lose a second time to President Bush. And uh, my best friend, Eli, uh, asked me uh, rhetorically, well, if we're so smart, why don't either of us do this for a living? And he meant it as a rhetorical question, but I couldn't let it go. And that question stuck with me and it, it really drove me to a question about what I was doing with my life and what I wanted to do with my time. And I shifted toward politics. I had built, started a career in web design and web development in the early days of the interactive web where we were really exploring these tools for the first time, changing storytelling in this sort of graph based way that I talk about in the book for the first time um, and shifted toward politics and where I really cut my teeth and learned politics was in Chicago where I landed after college. And after a few years of working, I worked. For, I went to work for Senator Durbin and was waiting tables to pay the bills, answering the phones as a Senate intern at age 28, because I didn't know what it meant to work in politics. So I just got the best first job I could find. And then Senator, then Senator Obama announced he was running for president. And I, I heard a leader talking in a different way about service and about what my power might be in a democracy that was working in a way I had never heard in my life. And I flung myself at the campaign and I had developed this very strange resume of like web design and web development and field organizing and, and what now would look like a resume well-designed for digital politics. But that wasn't even the language we used back then. I, I see Macon, my friend Macon in the audience, we used to call it new media. Um, I, because we thought it was new. I don't know what, I don't know why we called it that, but, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so we got into the, to the Obama world and what we realized was that we were not going to invent community organizing. Uh, President Obama believed in the power of building power in community. What we discovered very quickly at that moment in time, early 2007. So I joined the campaign in March, 2007, three weeks after the announcement. Facebook was brand, was had only been open to non-EDU addresses for a year and a half. Twitter was like six months old. And what we recognized was that we could not win a traditional primary. A traditional Democratic primary electorate was going to vote for a traditional Democratic primary candidate. And they had lots of good choices in 08. Right? That was a huge field, if we remember that moment. And they weren't going to vote for the then senator from Illinois with the funny name that no one had ever heard of. Like we were just not going to win a traditional primary. And that freed us up and inspired us to say, well, how do we make a not traditional primary? What does that mm -hmm. look like? What does it look like to create new mech to embrace these new mechanisms as new models for participation, for bringing community organizing into a scale and mm -hmm. a set of experiences and storytelling that was going to empower new people to participate in the process, many of which were young, many of whom were just first time voters, people who had been either not invited to participate in politics or outright excluded by the process for various reasons over the years. Mm -hmm. And what we discovered is that digital tools were a force multiplier for organizing. And that the power that you talked about, about our power to tell our own story was inherent to this new architecture. And we sort of stumbled into it. I mean, we didn't wake up every morning wondering how to be innovative. We woke up every morning going, how, how are we going to win? This is a path toward participation that feels more genuine and mm -hmm. that is going to include more people. And we, we built this engine that was grounded in President Obama's belief about leadership and belief about democracy and belief about power and 
the the digital tools were were entry points and mechanisms. And so when people always ask about how social media won the election, I always kind of laugh that they've we've sort of missing the point that organizing is organizing and community power is community power. And uh, that the digital tools were mechanisms for making this possible at a wildly greater scale. And mm -hmm. that demystification is actually why I started thinking about this book. So fast forward to 2012, and we had sort of institutionalized a, a, a digital way of thinking and enablement and making it part of everything that we did. And there had developed this like kind of incredible mythology about the Obama campaigns that felt disconnected from my experience of, of good politics and healthy democracy. And, and so I started to explore, so, okay, what was so different? What was so special? And I started working on this book in 2013. And mm -hmm. it was really that question about what was, what had happened in the world that made what we did possible? Mm -hmm. um, Chris Saka likes to use the phrase, timing has a lot to do with the success of a rain dance. And I think a lot of our success was rooted in some of that same timing, the same thing about Facebook, the same thing about this architectural shift in the way power and storytelling mm -hmm. have evolved over the last couple of decades. And it has led, unfortunately now, as commercialization has driven this sort of ubiquity and transformation of all of media, not just social, not just news, mm -hmm. all media into a graph, all media into a new architecture where we can't reliably predict where content will stay, where right. things that we publish will go. We have all become creators, consumers, and distributors of content, which is a totally different architecture. Mm -hmm. And well, I make- that's yeah. a place I want to stop you before you get ahead of yourself, because this is where I know there are some people watching going, hmm? because this is where you get into, you know, 15 plus years of expertise in the zone. And you begin talking about content verticals essentially existing in the round and how, how media has moved from channels to graphs. And I need you to break down exactly what that means, because again, I think those of us who've been trying to figure out what happened and how we went from, in a sense, the innocence of the early days of that campaign and the beginning of Twitter to now, rather than Twitter being a, a stream of thoughts and a way to find out about ideas, it is a three-dimensional space where every ounce of said space can be bought, where eyeballs can be paid for with exposure and sales. And, and it, has, it has become co-opted by um, corporate sales strategy. So it isn't quite the innocent place to find out what's happening in your neighborhood or about those cool guys who launched an eyeglasses company to democratize vision or it's changed so fast. It became the place where uh, a mass constituency of Americans could be inspired by a president who said, yes, we can, who, who said, I believe that America is meant to be America for all of us. It, it could then so quickly become this toxic place where a Donald Trump could become elected because he's an expert at shit posting, which is its own thing that happens on the internet now. So can you run us through what the beginning of that change, that, that, that shift from channels to graph, what does that mean? And, and when did it begin happening? Yeah, I think this is a really important sort of grounding in the dysfunction we feel is not our fault that the evolution of information and storytelling, storytelling is so fundamental to how we build and maintain community, how, how we create culture. Um, and the tools that we use to do that storytelling and to sort of define the communities that we operate in have been co-opted. And you talked about sort of that kind of beautiful, a little bit sort of optimism and idealism and naivete of the 08 campaign, even earlier than that, in sort of the early days of the rise of the internet, there was a lot of sort of naive cyber utopianism about what greater connectivity was gonna do for society. Yeah, and well, I we think- it was gonna be rosy and kind. Yeah, and inherently lead to uh, more vibrant liberal Western democracies and that these tools weren't, you know, couldn't be used for authoritarianism. And, and some of these things that have proven to be pretty naive. Mm -hmm. I think the, tr the trick is that ultimately 
those implicit beliefs about the goodness of greater, greater connectivity and the generativity of the internet were not made explicit requirements of the system. And so the, the mm. internet came up, sort of began to really rise in the 90s in a world where um, traditional mass media had been a sort of hierarchical system of channels since mass publishing in the 15th century. Right, where a publisher, uh, someone who wants to publish something uses a media channel to reach an audience. Mm -hmm. It's like stable, it's linear, it's hierarchical. Everybody's roles are very fixed. There are lots of gatekeepers who determine what is valid, what is credible, who's an authority. Mm -hmm. There are lots of problems with gatekeepers. Those gatekeepers were mostly engines for the status quo, which mostly meant white male hegemony for a long time. Mm -hmm. However, as those channels started to break and get knit back together into a graph. And what I mean by a graph is just a network where we are connected to each other in unpredictable ways. We're connected in ways that no one intended. Content that gets published in one mechanism gets shared in another. And it happens sort of without anyone's permission where we all have more power around our ability to tell more stories. That shift in architecture has undermined a couple of, a lot of concepts that we rely on for understanding information, for how to process what we process, including things like credibility and authority. In a world that is all stream-based and all graph-based, where we all have this new power, and this doesn't mean we are all equal. It is not a system of equality. It's a system of potential power being similar. Mm -hmm. But in that world, we also have more responsibility for understanding what we consume and for being able to understand things like credibility and authority without a gatekeeper being, a, being the dictator of those kinds of principles. The systems that we rely on for transmitting all this information aren't really incentivized to help us understand it well. As commercialization became the engine and venture capital became the engine for the growth and ubiquity of the systems, all of those implicit things that we wished and hoped that, they, that the internet was going to give us that we that we knew were possible in that sort of beautiful idealized way weren't explicit requirements of that commercialization process. And so these companies have optimized for what makes them money. And it turns out that it is much more profitable to enrage people, to sort people by confirmation bias, to create filter bubbles, to break down discourse, mm -hmm. than to encourage curiosity and creativity and to encourage people to live in proximity with difference, to like live with the discomfort of new things with curiosity rather than judgment to quote either Walt Whitman or Ted Lasso, depending on my mood, mm -hmm. um, maybe both. Um, and I can't stop myself from constantly bringing up this, the Spider-Man joke about with great power comes great responsibility because it shows up in the system all the time. Mm -hmm. If we have more power more and storytelling whoever who gets to tell stories is mm -hmm. an expression of power in society and that power was withheld from most people for most of civilization mm -hmm. it's now in many more almost everyone's hands not everyone there's still lots of boundaries and there's still lots of gatekeepers that make problematic choices and control over the system but that power means we have to become better levers of that power and the companies need to start to imagine the consequences they're having on discourse mm -hmm. because they are our de facto public sphere, whether they want to be or not, whether well, they intended to be or not. Well, and that's one of the things that feels very interesting to me because we, I would, I would estimate that most of us can understand or agree with the idea that you just proposed, that shared narratives build shared culture. And... What's interesting to me is the way that the narrative sphere has continued to bifurcate over and over and over again and, and segment out. When we see the data that proves to us how dangerous this is, even if we, you know, um, bird's eye view, take it out of the US and, and we go to the UK and we look at Brexit and we see that Facebook claimed they were gonna crack down on political ads that were made up of lies because of what happened here. So they weren't gonna allow it in the Brexit referendum vote. And then the data came out that 85% of the ads that were run on Facebook about the vote were lies and 85% of them were bought by Boris and Crow. Shocker. And it was 
wild to me that we can have the proof of a broken system and we can have the proof that one of these mass conglomerates, which has become uh, a sort of demogorgon of power in terms of the stories it's capable of telling and cycling and allowing each of us who is a member of it to tell. Um, totally agree with you, Katie. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm giggling at the Q and at the chat. Um, but that there's no repercussions that they can right. say, we won't allow this, but then they do because it's profitable. And my curiosity is, um, one of the theories that you posit is that authority, what, what was authoritative in terms of whom you can trust, you know, what news organizations, what news anchors, et cetera, the, that authority has shifted to popularity. So you can be a QAnon crazy, you can be a conspiracy theory liar, you can be a, a just horrible, vitriolic, you know, racist nightmare on the internet and have a huge following and be allowed to maintain it and, and to uh, be sort of suggested to other users and viewers because of your popularity alone. What do we do about that? So this I, this speaks to two, two, two problems at the same time. And, and I, people always ask, well, what do we do? And the, the answer is there's a whole bunch of dom we've we've been living through this process for a while now, decade or mm -hmm. so, where we've we've been sort of heading toward heading toward the the waterfall. And there are a bunch of dominoes that kind of need to go over it all at once. So I talked about sort of personal power and understanding what we can do differently. There's a question in the QA about the role of government in civic life. Mm -hmm. And one of the roles of government and a public conversation about what we need from public spaces that never got expressed. These companies are operating under their own incentives and under their own um, governance, right? I don't want Mark Zuckerberg determining what is valid. What I want is the, we allowed sort of the privatization of a conversation that needed to be a public conversation. It needs to be about what do we need good, healthy discourse to look like? What types of protocols and systems and measurement do we need to have in place so that the di so our discourse can function that we want to create as guides for these companies to innovate around. And so when you think about what you just, this sort of experience you just described about the utter indistinguishability of, you know, a conspiracy theory from Alex Jones, a beautifully well-written, well-researched in, uh, uh, investigative report from the Washington Post, and an update from my mom about her cat. There's a problem in our information ecology when I can't tell the difference, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's in the in the key here. One of the keys here is that it is in the interest of these of the economics of these platforms for me not to be able to tell, mm -hmm. because it keeps me engaging. It keeps me sort of responding with this sort of most emotional, most limbic. I talk a lot about the idea of the tyranny of outrage being the thing driving my response to the world. And if you keep me in a state where I'm overwhelmed cognitively, I can't possibly consume everything that's coming at me. I'm afraid because everything seems like an attack, which is both a feature of the media systems, but also a feature of our politics, right? It's a, it's a, a type of sort of campaigning we have embraced where the volume is always at 11 and our opponents are enemies that mm -hmm. is that is related, these are interrelated facts, then I am going to keep clicking based on instinct. I'm not thinking very much about what's happening. And so the values that I'm talking about, about a public conversation, about what kind of democracy and what kind of society, what kind of systems we need, get codified both as cultural requirements and expectations, but also as regulation. And so while the platforms themselves can take actions every day, all the time to make this healthier, if they are incentivized to or demanded and required to by us, mm -hmm. by brands who spend the trillion dollars a year that make the attention economy go, or encouraged in specific directions by regulations designed to accommodate systems that are totally different from the way the systems that we currently, the regulations we currently have that were written for like terrestrial radio, right? We just <laughs> can't expect a regulatory environment what, that wasn't designed for this world to work this way. We have mm -hmm. deregulated information large consistently since the 80s. 
right? We got rid of the fairness doctrine. We've gotten rid of the idea of, uh, you know, which, which was really about sort of creating space for multiple points of view in public airwaves and when people were reliant on spectrum. And that really opened the doorway to sort of totally breaking the idea of what news was supposed to be for. The mm -hmm. news was meant to inform rather than to convince or persuade. And there are pieces of this regulatory environment <coughs> that touch on news, information, liability. Peter in the quote in the chat is asking about section 230, which is a really important part of our existing um, internet regulatory environment that removes liability from platforms that are, that are neutral transmitters of information. And the Facebooks and Twitters of the world have used that as a way to shield themselves from liability from user-generated content. Right. Some people call this the, the clause that birthed the internet because it meant there were no consequences for creating systems that destroy society. The right. problem is if you're making algorithmic choices about what I see, you're not neutral. Facebook yeah. is not a neutral arbiter of any of this. Yeah. And at the yeah. end of the day, we don't want them to be. We mm -hmm. believe that certain speech is, needs to be protected. And mm -hmm. we believe that certain speech needs to be excluded. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in unifying with white supremacy. Like this is not a make room for everything conversation. This is about reclaiming a, a space. And look, this is really hard. This is one thing I wanna, I don't wanna hand wave like reclaiming the boundaries of like valid productive discourse because mm -hmm. the edges are really complicated. Yeah. And I'm super opinionated about wh what I want, what kind of dis diversity and, and sort of proximity to discomfort I'm interested in engaging with. But those boundary cases are really tough. But we have to engage with this question with some openness and honesty as a public conversation rather than privatizing what we have. So that's part of the role of government in helping us reclaim the space is forcing these platforms to consider this part of their responsibility because whether they want it or not, they have it. And well, go ahead. One of the things, it's very funny because I'm like, I don't know where this reflection is coming from. This is work from home. I'm just gonna yeah. sit this and talk to you for the rest of the hour. Sure. Uh, one of the you look things- look so relaxed. You know, everything. Sure. Um, yeah. Trying not to burn out my retinas with the reflection of the sun from minor detail bouncing. Uh, but one of the things I keep coming back to, as, as many of us are having this discourse, is that you cannot, without punishment, legal recourse, scream fire in a movie theater. Yes. You can't we have it. lots of limits on speech already. Exactly. There are limits everywhere. And this notion that people should be uh, allowed because of the First Amendment to spout white supremacist or Nazi rhetoric, to, to lie to their constituents. I mean, just this morning I was venting to you that Kevin McCarthy, our dear GOP leader, who I would just love to see run out of office as soon as possible, is lying on the news today, or actually this was yesterday now. Um, and I'm looking at the quote, I pulled it up in advance of, of our conversation. He said, that there are people from the terrorist watch list from Yemen, Iran, and Turkey being caught coming across the southern border at the moment. And what I love is that actual members of, you know, our national security uh, sector are responding to him. And, and one such gentleman said, I have the same security clearance as you. Uh, can you have your office arranged for a classified briefing for members to see where this information is being derived from, or are you lying? And I think that that is so interesting because all these guys have, you know, taken a page from the Trump playbook and said, oh, we'll just say the most incendiary things, even though they're lies and we'll never be held to account. And if we allow that, we will become more of a banana republic than we have begun to become or, or began becoming in the, in the prior administration. And what is fascinating to me is that they'll tweet it, they'll say it. The, the article will be quoted on the Twitter page of news organizations, but the correction when it comes doesn't travel as fast. Lies travel between 1,500 and 1,600 times the speed online that truth does. So there must be some responsibility taken by these platforms. There must well, Lies be are at the top of the page and retractions are at the bottom. Exactly. Right? This is, this is one- that that you're 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 clearly right, and I think one of the tricks here is 
that there aren't, we talked about this earlier, there's no part of the sort of the infinite stream interface, the lack mm -hmm. of history, the instantaneousness of our conversation. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a discourse that's allergic to nuance. Yeah. It's also really like difficult to, to maintain any sense of accountability or consequences. Mm -hmm. And this is something, it, I was thinking about this today because I got into a conversation about consequences uh, in, a, in another, another interview I did last week. They, it might be, John Kerry might be the last politician that really got, like where flip-flopping was really a problem for him. And he ended up being the secretary of state anyway. So it's not like it was that big a deal, uh, yeah. but he did lose an election partially based on it. Um, and, but the instantaneousness, the lack of history we have in the way we think about and engage in discourse is part of the problem that we don't have a sense of history. We don't have a, an idea about like, well, what did I, what hot take did I say yesterday that no one's holding me to, right? Mm -hmm. That's true for me. That's true for, you know, major, majority leader McCarthy. It's true for president Trump. Mm -hmm. It's true for all of us that we are all sort of unbound from like a sense of, you know, what comes from this is we're unbound from this like sense of consequence for right. speech. And so, too often free speech, people interpret free speech as consequence free speech. And mm -hmm. that's not actually, I am not libertarian enough to think that's a good idea. Like that's yeah. not where I come from. That's not how I think about what it means to be healthy. Lee Bodner in the chat was asking about, can we agree uh, uh, about what civic discourse looks like? Probably not, but mm -hmm. we can have that debate as like a center point of defining this public sphere that we occupy. And the mm -hmm. debate, the healthy debate is actually part of the process that we don't have right now. Yes, like The ability to sort of argue and, and disagree productively, to debate in safety. And safety is a really tricky concept because mm -hmm. what's safe for me as a cis white male is very different than what be, might be safe for someone else. In America, mm -hmm. I'm almost always safe. It's the nature of the systems we live in. So what's my responsibility then as a bridge? Mm -hmm. What responsibility comes with that safety well, as a way for all of us to start to interact differently? What do you think in terms of what we have been going through as a collective societal learning, especially since the last administration began? You know, we, everyone is, is able to begin licking their wounds and doing some healing since President Biden has been inaugurated uh, and, you know, people are getting vaccinated, but I'm curious what- Minor detail. Think, minor detail, oh, oh, a plan, who knew? But I'm, I'm really curious what you think in terms of the learning you've gone through, you mentioned as a, you know, cishet white man, what, what do you see as some of your responsibility in terms of how you can advocate from your position of safety in the public discourse about this, because as we've been discussing, you know, both on on this chat with everyone, and thank you all for continuing to be here with us and submit such excellent questions, um, and and as we've been talking about this for many years now, and you say in the book, our public sphere is built on private companies, and we rely on those private companies to provide our public goods through the public sphere. But the thing that seems to be an awakening for everyone right now is the truth that these systems are not in fact broken. They're working as they were designed for the Correct. benefit of their designers, for the benefit of the ruling class, the uber wealthy. You know, the fact that you and I and every domestic worker and school teacher and everyone in between all of our spheres of income pays far more in taxes than guys like Mark Zuckerberg, Donald Trump or Jeff Bezos is a problem. So how do you, in this moment, see your responsibility for advocacy and discourse, um, again, from that position of safety that you are aware that you sit in? Uh, I, th I think there's two, there's two things really important in the question. One, you sort of talked about sort of the experience of the last administration. And I think there's an important reality, which is that there, there's a little bit of a, a dream in our heads about sort of Obama land giving way to Trump's America. And I think ultimately those worlds were coexistent mm -hmm. in ways that we don't often acknowledge that mm -hmm. the same, I, I sort of start the introduction with my experience of waking up on election, the day after election day in 2008, and then waking up on after the day after election in 2016 and how rocked, rocked 
different parts of the world felt by both of those experiences mm. that the rise of President Obama was interpreted by large swaths of the country as like a victory of like liberal coastal elites over traditional values and a collapse of Americanism. There's a like real pain there. I, and like, I don't agree with it, um, but there, there's real discomfort there about the direction of a cult country and a culture that has roots in some like valid lived experience. Now, the how that gets expressed and how that uncertainty about the future and the, sort of a sense of futurelessness mm. that a lot of the country has been sort of uh, forced to accept by like often increasingly left coastal like left uh, sort of leftists or dem Democrats or liberals, however, whatever language we want to use is a sense of futurelessness that is easy to opportunistically take advantage of if you are interested in a naked grasp for power and have authoritarian tendencies, mm -hmm. President Trump. That mm -hmm. there was something at work there, an uncertainty about the future that was not effectively heard, recognized, understood, acknowledged, made space for in America that existed during the Obama administration. It didn't there's just like emerge like like a strange during the Clinton campaign. Like that's not what happened. It's part of this experience that we live in really, really disconnected worlds from the people around us. The, I think that the problem around what do we do about sort of this, this idea of fighting for discourse and fighting for a truly inclusive polity where we are all in fact part of a conversation is people like me need to do more than be allies. Allies is like the bare minimum requirement of coexisting with others. Mm -hmm. It's actually working to, uh, to elevate new voices and be protective of new voices in spaces where they're likely to feel unsafe is to mm -hmm. create more safety and share safety with others mm -hmm. in a way that makes it possible for us to live in proximity with more difference, more right. regularly, and not feel as afraid by it. Now, right. that is also part of what is required is responsible leaders not using fear as a mechanism of political persuasion. Mm -hmm. And there's a responsibility that comes from everyone else who leverages these tools that there's a culture of public service that has died, right? That, that we now have a, a pretty power-centric corporate political class that we were never meant to have. And that is related to the sort of kind of power you're describing about the inequalities of American culture. Well, but this is part of what fascinates me because for example, you know, the, the point that you brought up that there, there were communities that when Obama got elected were fed lies about how that meant that the coastal elites were winning. I mean, it, it, you even see it now being regurgitated with President Biden, yep. despite the fact that the American Rescue Plan will benefit people in rural yes. communities and in red states more than anything any of the Republicans have done in years. There is, the, there is this narrative, which is a lie, that somehow uh, liberalism is a coastal elite thing, which I always find laughable because I'm like, listen, if I were really a coastal elite, I'd be voting for Republicans who are going to lower my taxes. Like, what are we talking about? And, and what interests me about it is that the people who are spouting that narrative have been willing to say change, including diversification, racial change, gendered power change, more equality for the empowerment. LGBT, yes, means, all of the above means that traditional power holders are losing power in their minds. They're not, but we can prey on that. We can tell these people that they're losing and, some sense of control. And to your point, we haven't had leaders with enough ethical roots to be honest about what they're doing. So they say the coastal elites are coming when in fact, what they mean is we can make you feel afraid and we can tell you, you know, black and brown people and women and trans people are coming for your jobs. None of which is true. And, and what the magic word, but what fascinates me is that there is no consequence. And to your point, I, I will admit that it makes it very hard for me not to talk to people in red states or rural communities. I've lived in many. I have great friends who live in many. 
I am out there hustling on campaign trails for those people, those voters and those families in the same way that I am for my neighbors in the actual neighborhood I live in in California. And what frustrates me about the leaders and the leadership of, of that side is that there is an unwillingness, as you said, to dialogue. There is an unwillingness to admit which of our more liberal and inclusive policies will benefit the 99% of all people, not just people who they like to call, you know, diversity tokens, which I hate. Or traditional Americans sure. and, and oh, yeah, all right. these sort of like dog whistles. I'm like, I understand what that's code for. Thank you. So <laughs> I, what, what frustrates me is, is the false equivalency. Yep. And this is a thing that we talk about a lot as well that, that I would love your opinion on before we jump into the Q&A. There is a false equivalency happening where people say, well, CNN is as biased as Fox. That is categorically untrue. When one network, when Fox News is a propaganda organization for right wing domestic terrorist groups, like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, the fact that Anderson Cooper is saying all people should feel protected in their homes, this is not an equivalency of radicalism at all. And so I'm curious as, as you talk about how we get back, nope, this side, nope, this side is out of the sun. As you talk about how we get back <laughs> to an America that works for all the people and a media ecosystem that can work for all the people and, and a way for all of us to be able to identify when we are being exposed to truth or lies, how are we, how are we as viewers and how are we as average citizens able to say, stop with the false equivalency, stop acting like January 6th has any business in conversation with peaceful protests that were the largest civil rights marches on earth in earth's history this past summer when BLM became a global social cry for justice. You know, how do we begin to write the, the seesaw? There's because two, there's two crazy. solutions in your question. The first okay. one, the magic word is narrative. And it, and it speaks to the right has invested in narrative and ideology for a generation and the left has invested in McConnell's 40 year plan has invested in policy. And I am not bullish about Mitch McConnell's behavior changing. I am not interested in a solution that requires him to be a more faith to, to stop being a faithless negotiator. <laughs> I, I, it's just not, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm just not going to hold my breath and there's too much fucking work to do. So I'm not going to wait. So the narrative problem is not that Republicans uh, or conservatives are dishonest. It's, I look at the 2020 election. I watch millions of Americans vote for the first time for President Trump right. and take that, yes, as a, as a sort of a demonstration of sort of the like siloing and sorting and confirmation bias of media systems, but also as a repudiation of the Democratic Party. We did not have a story for those people that competed with four more years of what they had just been through and yeah. half a million dead Americans. That is a lack of narrative clarity about the direction of the country and the future that we want that does not include, look, there are, this is not a, there are good people on both sides conversation. Like, I just want to be really clear. Like, there are lots of people in the conservative movement who are genuinely white supremacist, who genuinely want to sustain systems, whether they're conscious of the bias or, of, or the oppression or not, that are have been and always have been deeply racist and sexist. But there are also a bunch of people who've been dragged along in mm -hmm. that conversation that would be desperate to not vote for someone like President Trump if there was a narrative that they felt like they were part of. Yes, and those are the people I think, to your point, no, we're not having a conversation about good people on both sides at the margins. But I think right. we do when we talk about yes. discourse, we need to admit that in the sort of more central part of our spectrum from center out, you know, right and left, there are a lot of really incredible, lovely people yes. in this mix 
who feel disheartened by a system that has made the news and who you vote for feel more like an MMA cage match than yeah. a, a place where you're allowed to go and be curious, philosophical. And, and, and well, and, and, and enemies, and the, the language of war that has become part of our political campaigning is also mm -hmm. part of the problem. Enemies rather than opponents, killing rather than beating. Like this language matters and the narratives and the stories that we tell are part of how we mm -hmm. start to create some healing. The second part of the, the conversation, you know, the first part is this sort of question about narrative. The second is ultimately about giving back individual agencies so that we can demand different things. Eli Cohen asked the question in the Q&A, and by the way, I'm pretty sure that's the same Eli Cohen I was referencing in the 2004 thing that got me into politics this first time, fuck you, Eli. Uh, <laughs> uh, but he he was he, he and this I have this like group of best friends that we like live in this conversation called Washington Week. I like actually reference it in the acknowledgement of the book. But he always asking about specific policies, and all of them relate to the idea of re-empowering, putting individuals at the center of this architecture, and empowering individuals to make better choices, greater mm -hmm. distinguishability of content, greater distinguishability of intent. Mm -hmm. Look, if if. Fox News doesn't, so I think the big difference between Fox News and MSNBC, MSNBC is not bias. I think MSNBC is deeply ideologically biased. They are a proudly progressive liberal news organization. I think the problem is that we call them news. The mm -hmm. problem with Fox News is there's no adherence to fact. And that mm -hmm. is a different distinction than ideological bias. Truth is about adherence to fact. Bias is a whole different bag of cats. And I don't know that we've ever, humans are terrible at being unbiased. We're just not good at that. We're, we're, we're terrible. We've never been good at it. I think we lived through this sort of like myopic golden era of like Walter Cronkite was unbiased. He wasn't unbiased. He just said what other white males wanted to hear. And it just sort of like seemed like it was for everyone. Like that's not what I want to go back to. What I want is I want the, the, my TV guide to say wildly biased conservative commentary all day long on channel 24 wildly biased liberal commentary all day long on channel 25 and what the fuck happened on channel 26 <laughs> like i want to start being able to distinguish yeah. the intent of what people are trying to tell me and the stories that people are trying to tell me and i when i think about news news is a is a word and a concept that we've like really abused to like We've yeah. put lots of things in that bucket. And it started with the collapse of the fairness doctrine. Uh, Sam asked this question in here and I'm start, starting to pull in some of the Q and A yeah, around I'm bringing sure. back the fairness doctrine. Do you May, think we maybe, could do it? I think we could. I think ultimately what, what it gives us and what I want is not necessarily the, what, cause it was built around the problems around the scarcity of spectrum, which you don't really have anymore. Yeah. So I don't know that what we need is a fairness doctrine where re scarce resources need to be fairly distributed, which is where mm -hmm. the concept came from. Um, but more clarity about labeling and distinguishability and intent and these other yeah. things achieve the same, ultimately achieve some of the same questions for me. Yeah, given the example you just gave, I mean, the fact that on multiple occasions, Fox News has been sued in court and their defense has been to go on legal record and say, we are not a news program. We right. are an entertainment program. Entertainment. We call Fox News, but we do not claim to be news. And right. and the idea that one of the most watched news channels would say that in court, and also by the way, um, it turns out know, words mean things, and mean we need things. them to mean things. Yeah, and and they they actually uh, defended themselves in one case, saying that no soberly intelligent person would mistake their opinion shows for, or no, I'm sorry, no averagely intelligent person would mistake their opinion shows for sober news. And I thought, wow, so you just called all your viewers stupid in court. Interesting. And, and I don't, I don't like that. I don't like that. That's how they treat their viewers. And I don't like that. That's um, sort of what these big conglomerate companies think of any of us who are watching their programming. So if we, if we considered, um, you know, to Sam's point, in your estimation, a new version of a fairness doctrine, what do you think the modern media landscape doctrine would need to be to create a more sober I think, news? I think it speaks to, so the, the sort of principles that govern the concept of journalism now were largely sort of crafted by the Columbia Journalism School in the early 20th century mm -hmm. as a response to what was called then yellow journalism and trying to codify this sort of like 
principles of being unbiased and uh, the idea of, uh, you know, uh, of objectivity and some of these other pieces. I think we need to go through a similar process again, given the constraints of the world we live in now and a re-articulate a set of principles. And that's, by the way, sounds really simple to similar to what I think we need around our public sphere in general is mm. that we take too many things for granted. The more of this we can turn into a public conversation about explicit requirements, the more likely we are to design what we want rather than accidentally get things that aren't going to work for us. Mm. Um, there's a really important question here from Katie Harbath, who I'm going to out just finished. Congratulations, Katie. You just finished. She just finished a decade of work at Facebook in the elections group and has been like an incredibly mm. tireless, awesome part of their team there. Um, and she's asking a really important question about world leaders. And this speaks to the principles question, which is why I'm elevating this now about respond to, how would you respond to world leaders concerned about President Trump being deplatformed? And I think the, the question there is, these spaces are private. This is not a First Amendment question. This is about, again, about clarity of intent about the nature of a public sphere and a public space. And being holding all people accountable to a similar set of principles. Now, is it really, really difficult to cover the, a president spewing disinformation? So hard. Is it hard to cover misinformation and disinformation without accidentally spreading misinformation and disinformation? So hard. But I don't think we need a separate set of rules about these private spaces. If those rules are clear, it, like that they are well adhered to, that they are publicly debated, that the algorithms become more transparent, right? One of the things I want is the ability to know what choices are being made for me. I talked about like wanting a different TV guide with like hyper biased on one channel and another hyper biased on another channel in this room. If I look at that every single day and I click on one of those three and eventually the system learns that I'm not gonna click on the other two and it stops showing them to me, Mm. I have lost something. I have gained efficiency, but I have lost the choice mm -hmm. of saying, I don't want that. And turns out that choice matters a lot. And a mm. lot of the efficiency choices that we are faced with around information ultimately aren't that good for us, right? Efficiency isn't, we, we have, this is one of the sort of like downstream consequences of sort of the industrialization of culture and meaning where we have embraced efficiency as a moral good in a lot of contexts. And it hurts us in all kinds of places in society, but it really damages mm -hmm. our ability to make choices on a regular basis is a power that we need to be able to express. So ultimately for Katie, I, 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 have, I actually think Facebook waited too long. I think he, that President mm -hmm. Trump had been, and, and Twitter too, had been uh, in well and abuse of other policies for a long time, but they were stuck and they were, they didn't want to have to be able to do this alone. And this speaks to another question in the, in the, in the, in the list of, from Eric Kessler, which is what do you make of Zuckerberg asking for more federal regulation? I think Zuckerberg is desperate not to have all this responsibility to himself. Yeah. I think he is desperate for leaders to come along and express some moral leadership and help define the boundaries of this public sphere that then Facebook and all their brilliance can design toward. Mm -hmm. I don't think he wants the responsibility he has. Mm -hmm. And I think it's up to us to take it back, right? This is where I get really optimistic about what is possible here. Because when I have a conversation like this, when I talk to People, I now live in a swing district. I live in a rural county. I'm a volunteer fighter fighter and an EMT in a fire in a fire department. This is all made up of like crusty working class New, New England Republicans. And what we are bound together by is that we care more about waking up at three o'clock in the morning to help our neighbor who fell on the floor than anything else. Yeah. And that's what we do. And we do it together. And I've learned more about community from these mostly men who've like lived in this community their whole lives. And I'm new here. Mm -hmm. And, but that's how it became a local by yeah. participating community and democracy are things we do together. Mm -hmm. And we have to be willing to be in that proximity in ways that open up our minds to what is possible. And this conversation works when we slow down. Mm -hmm. It works when we are not sort of subservient to the like 
algorithms and speed and hot takes and, and sort of the like lack of nuance that the media systems demand of us, right. we ca are capable of nuance. Well, we have, there's such excellent examples of that. You know, even as we have seen people call for certain things in the public sphere on the internet, when they happen in real life, so often people say, wait, 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 you know, you saw it with mass deportations that, that began years ago um, under Trump boosting ICE. And so many people in deeply red districts said, wait, but I didn't think you were gonna take my neighbor who owns the restaurant in town. He's great, why him? What's happening? We didn't even know, we, we weren't campaigning against him. It, it, the internet allows us to kind of have these feelings about um, ideas rather than real people. And we we interact with each other as caricature exactly. and not as people. Exactly. And when you're part of a real community, you know people three-dimensionally, you know their hearts, you understand their experiences, you see their children getting on the school bus with yours. And and I I, I feel hopeful when I hear about human interaction. And I feel hopeful when I hear about the ways that communities come together despite how anyone votes. And I, and I feel hopeful when you say you have hope that we can beat this. And I'm curious, you know, as we've been going through these great Q and A questions, you know, one of them speaks to how do we beat the algorithms that are feeding us more and more of what we believe? How would you say to people, um, obviously, read the book, learn, but how would you say to people who are here with us today, they might have a hand in re-engineering what their internet shows them? I, I think it's a great question. And it, it comes back to this question about like building, rebuilding personal agency and reclaiming personal agency. And, and this is work, right? Like it's important to remember that if you feel like you're losing a battle you, it's because you're swimming against a multi-billion dollar stream every day and it's fucking exhausting. It's not your fault. It is not your fault that you feel disconnected. It is not your fault that this feels dysfunctional. It is dysfunctional and we are trying to push um, back on it, to reclaim something that we need because we need community. And so some of the things that we can start to try to do are things like turn off all the notifications on your phone except something from like your wife or your mom. Mm -hmm. Take all of your social media apps off your home screen. Uh, switch your phone to black and white. Mm -hmm. Get yourself further away from the mechanisms that are designed to make you addicted to FOMO and a sense that you are incomplete because you didn't hear the thing that just happened. And mm -hmm. they play on our psychology in ways that make them deeply addictive. And because we are craving community, especially in this moment, especially during a pandemic when we are cut off from each other and where for the for, for the first time in a lot of ways, we are actually being told for public health reasons that other people are dangerous. Yeah. That sets a frame for our experience of the world that makes us even more susceptible to conspiracy theories designed to in-group and out-group us. Mm. And so we have to find subtle ways of pushing back. Um, unfortunately, I think that has to be the last question, oh, but I wanna funny. share one thing, <laughs> yeah. which is we were asked, to, to recommend a book. What are we reading? Yes. And this is a book by Arundhati Roy called Azadi. And she is one of the most beautiful, gifted poets and writers that exists on this planet. I am uh, indebted to her essays and thinking for so much of my perspective about the world. Mm. And she's written an essay called The Pandemic is a Portal, which is the last essay in this, in this, in this catalog or yeah. in this collection. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through it lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. Mm. That's the world I wanna live in. Like that's the world that is available to us right now if mm. we can try to pull pull back from being just inventory try to pull back from the idea that we are just part of these systems pull back from the idea that we are just labor for an economy meant to generate wealth efficiency right humans are meant for more than that 
And that's the next conversation that we need to be able to get to and why media reform and transformation is so essential mm -hmm. because that conversation is really hard mm -hmm. and it's really important. And we're not going to be able to have it well with systems that aren't interested in nuance and aren't interested in us being humans. I think the reclamation of nuance is the path forward for all of us. And it's the way in which we remind ourselves that people with different opinions aren't really that different than we are. And that yes, there, there may be fringe folks uh, on the edges who wish harm to others who we don't need to worry about uniting with, but the majority of us have the capability to unite. And, and something that I will say, and I'm, I'm not just saying that your book is the one that I'm reading because we're doing this today. It just happens to be the one that I'm reading. Before your book, I, I read uh, Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, which was fabulous. But Beautiful. you know, one of the things that you really highlight here for me is as we've talked about this moving you know, into a graph, which feels very scary, you have made it very clear that democracy is not incompatible with the graph. Our civic life has not been irreparably destroyed, but it is ours. It is our civic life and it is ours to reclaim. And so I think that uh, this is really, for me, the, the hope that I needed after the exhaustion um, of, of the last four years. And to your point, the hyperpolarization that began happening even through the Obama era. So many people saw that kind of societal disruption and advancement as an opening for chaos. And we have to look at the, uh, the sort of writing of the ship as an opening and an opportunity for healing and innovation and, and for a real uplifting of nuance in, in my estimation. Look, and that the last thought, that healing you're talking about, anybody who's ever tried to heal a relationship, the first step we take back toward each other is an act of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to act like if, if our civic life were dependent on the people we need to forgive, what would we do differently? I think we would behave really differently tomorrow. Mm -hmm. so, after party at Comet Pizza, Eric Kessler's treating. <laughs> oh, Kessler, hi. Wow, I wish we could all do that together. I oh, think and uh, mm -hmm. Donna Denise, who is my high school English teacher to whom I dedicated the book just sat in and uh, said thank you to the, for the discussion. Ms. Denise, I'm so glad well done, you were here. Donna. <laughs> Amazing. I think I echo the sentiments of the entire audience when I say how inspired we all are by this discussion. We really want to thank Michael Slaby, Sophia Bush, and our audience out there for tuning in and offering such engaging questions. Your patronage and dedication enable us to bring this kind of amazing programming, and we couldn't do it without the book sales to support it. So please follow the link in the chat to get your copy of For All the People, Redeeming the Promises of Modern Media and Reclaiming Our Civic Life or just visit politics-pros.com. And while you're there, you can check out our events calendar for everything we've got coming up down the line. And from our shelves to yours, we hope you're out there staying strong, staying safe, and of course, staying well-read. And we will see you all next time so we can keep this conversation going. Bye everyone. Thanks everyone for coming.